Playing near water is dangerous enough, but when it's boiling hot, the results can be tragic. Michelle was less than a year old when she fell into a bath of hot water and had to be rushed to hospital. With burns over most of her arms and legs, doctors feared for her life. The usual way of treating a burn is to cut some skin from an unaffected part of the body and place it onto the wound to grow. But skin takes a long time to grow back and the painful wounds need covering fast before infection sets in. So, Michelle's doctors decided to try out a new technique, growing skin in the laboratory. They start with a small sample of unaffected skin from the patient and cut it up into smaller pieces. Skin is made up of tiny building blocks called cells. Scrape a scalpel across the skin and some of the cells will rub off and fall into the surrounding liquid. To see them, you need to look through a microscope, which makes them look about 300 times bigger than they really are. Each round blob is a single cell. The cells are placed into a flask of nutritious pink liquid, which helps keep the cells alive and provides them with food and water for them to grow. Every few hours, cells divide. They don't get bigger, they simply grow in number. As they divide, they eventually cover the bottom of the jar. After three or four weeks, the cells have multiplied to form a thin layer of skin. What was once just a few individual cells has grown into a large sheet, but it's fragile and very flimsy. To make it easier to handle, this almost invisible sheet is clipped onto a piece of surgical dressing. A small sample of skin can be grown to produce about 50 of these sheets, which is enough to cover the burns on Michelle's legs. Thanks. After several months, Michelle's new skin is looking better. The new technique has proved a success, and by growing skin quickly in this way, it's helped save her life. Each small patch of skin grown in the laboratory was made up of about two million cells. So how many skin cells do you think are covering your body? These are microscopic animals and plants. Rather than being made of many cells, they simply exist as single cells on their own. These images have been magnified hundreds of times. The single cells are so small that you can't normally see them. It was only with the invention of the microscope, just over 300 years ago, that creatures like this became visible. Before then, no one knew that cells existed. Ah. <laughs> you know, the closer you look at things, the more amazing they seem to get. If I hold this piece of cork in my hand, it has a definite shape, feel, I can see the colour, but put it under my new microscope. Um, uh, well, I've never seen anything like it in my life. <laughs> oh. ah. This is Robert Hooke. It's 1665 and microscopes have only just been invented. For the first time, scientists were able to look at things too small to be seen by the naked eye, and Robert Hooke was fascinated by what he saw. Oh! <laughs> this piece of cork seems to be made up of tiny compartments, like lots of little rooms all fitted together. Rooms or cells. Yes, they look like cells. Hooke became famous for being the first person to use the word cell to describe the room-like structures inside his piece of cork. 
He spent many hours carefully drawing their honeycomb pattern. Although Hook gave cells their name, nobody knew what they were or even what they did. To find out more about cells, scientists had to be able to see in more detail. But the early microscopes of the 1600s just weren't good enough. It was 150 years before better lenses were crafted and a clearer picture became possible. In 1833, one of the leading botanists of the time was Scotsman Robert Brown. Having travelled the world and collected hundreds of plants, he made a startling discovery. There are so many plants, all of them so different, except, except when I look at them close up. Every plant is made up of cells, and inside every cell there is a sort of dark, dense blob. Whichever plant I choose, it's always the same. I can find not one single exception. Robert Brown called the blob-like structure inside each cell the nucleus. About this time, scientists were beginning to realise that all living things were made of cells. A few years later, in 1839, two German scientists, Dr Schwann and Dr Schleiden, came up with a theory which was to change the way scientists viewed the living world. Dr Schwann? Yeah, Dr. Schlein. That's them. I think we have discovered something completely amazing. The material inside the cell moves about. Very slowly, I grant you, but still, she moves. We can only conclude one thing from this. You mean? Yeah, the cells are alive. <coughs> This got them thinking. Sometimes a single cell exists on its own. But more complex creatures like you or I are made up of millions of living cells, all working together. All living things are made of cells, no matter how big or small, like a plant. Even this fly. Yeah. And the theory they eventually came up with was that cells are the basic building blocks of life. From then on, science has never looked back. As better microscopes have been developed, our view of the world has changed. And scientists have been able to look at small things in more and more detail. This pinhead has been magnified by a modern electron microscope. Instead of making the pin hundreds of times bigger, it magnifies it thousands of times. At an even greater magnification, the speckles on the pin can be seen to be tiny bacteria, very simple single cells. An amoeba is one of the simplest living creatures. This single cell is able to make food, to grow and to reproduce all on its own. It's completely self-sufficient. Humans and larger animals are much more complicated. We are made up of many millions of cells. A typical animal cell is like a tiny blob of jelly. Take a look inside and there's a nucleus surrounded by a jelly-like substance called cytoplasm. The outer covering is called the cell membrane. The cell membrane acts a bit like a barrier, controlling what passes in and out. Only certain substances like food and raw materials are allowed in. Waste and other chemicals pass out. The nucleus is the control centre of the cell. It dishes out instructions to other parts of the cell and contains all the information for making new ones. The cytoplasm is a jelly-like substance inside the cell membrane. It's here that all the chemical reactions which keep the cell alive take place. As time goes by, part of the cell might need repairing. When this happens, 
the nucleus sends out information for new growth. Food which enters the cell is used in a series of chemical reactions. And hey presto! A new part of the cell is made. The old part of the cell is removed and quickly replaced. Each cell is alive, moving, growing, repairing itself until it gets too old and then the whole cell is replaced with a new one. Human cells come in all shapes and sizes. Some have specific jobs to do. The surface of the tube into your lungs is kept moist with mucus. Bacteria and dust stick to it. To stop these unwanted substances from entering your lungs, the cells on these surfaces have tiny microscopic hairs which wave around and push the mucus up to your throat. These are blood cells. They're filled with a red pigment which carries oxygen. And this is a nerve cell. But why is it this peculiar elongated shape? Some of the largest plants on Earth are the giant sequoia trees. They've been growing on the west coast of America for hundreds of years. Like all plants, they're made of cells, millions of them, all joined together. Some of the smallest plants on Earth are microscopic algae. These can be only a few cells small. But there's a whole host of plant life in between. Walk through any park or woodland and you'll see plenty of variety. But there are some plants that are not so pretty. To you or I, nettles are a stinging plant to be avoided at all costs. An unwanted weed. But they're more useful than you might think. Because nettles have tough stalks, they can be used to make clothes. Peel off the outer bark of the stem and underneath there's a mass of stringy fibres. It's these long hair-like fibres which can be spun into a thread and used to make fabric. Each fibre is made of just a few cells. So what is it that makes them so strong? Typical plant cells have a box-like shape. Just like animal cells, they have a nucleus and a cell membrane. But plant cells also have a cell wall. It's a rigid outer covering made of a strong material called cellulose. It's the thick cell walls in the nettle fibres that make them so strong and useful. The fibre is tough and difficult to work with, but once you have enough of it, combing out any remaining bits of bark make it easier to spin into a thread. The fibres are gently twisted between the fingers and spun into a yarn, ready to be woven into cloth. Who would have thought that what was once a bunch of stinging nettles could be turned into something you can wear? Thanks to their tough cell walls, Nettle fibres don't break easily, so these plant cells allow all kinds of clothes to be made. Putting nettle clothing next to your skin won't sting, but will it catch on? While some crops are grown for the fibres in the stems, most are grown to be eaten. Plants are unique. 
they're able to capture the sun's energy and convert it into food. Each green leaf of a plant is like a mini factory. Its raw materials are water and carbon dioxide. Water travels from the roots, up through the stem, and eventually to the leaves. Carbon dioxide passes through tiny holes in the surface. A chemical reaction with sunlight converts the water and carbon dioxide into sugars. This happens inside the cells of each leaf. These green blobs are called chloroplasts. They act a bit like solar panels, harnessing the sun's energy to make the reactions possible. Leaf cells contain many chloroplasts, which is what makes them look so green. So why are root cells colourless? Roots normally grow deep underground. They don't contain green chloroplasts because they don't normally see the light of day. Instead, root cells are specially designed to be good at taking in water. These cells grow hairs to increase their surface area. Cells in different parts of the plant are designed to do different jobs. OK, you guys. I'm here to tell you about our latest underground operation. So listen up. I called you here because we got an emergency on our hands. It's a matter of life or death. The boss says this plant of ours needs water, fast. There's only one thing for it. I need root cells to go in search of new water supplies. But it's got to be the right cell for the job. So I'm looking for a cell with credentials. OK, Sunshine, use first. Hey, an underground job ain't for you. You need to be out in the sun soaking up all those rays and keeping those chloroplasts of yours healthy. What about you, tough guy? Uh, with a strong cell wall like that, there's no way you'd be absorbing any water. A stem is definitely more your style. Hey, we got an imposter here. Animal, what do you think you're doing here? This is a job for plant cells only. Now, what was I telling you? I'm looking for a root cell. A long, thin root cell to go in search of water. Ah, this is hopeless. There just ain't nobody long enough for an underground job these days. What? Hey, hey, what's going on? Now, that's more like it. 